Most of you know me for the work I have done in software engineering and software architecture. In that journey, I've had the wonderful opportunity to be witness to the exquisite beauty of software-intensive systems, as well as the frightening fragility of them as well. As we as a society begin to continually surrender ourselves to computing technology, it leads us to ponder the question of what does it mean in this co-evolution of computing and humanity. In my journey, my professional journey, a lot of my early work was indeed in methodology and software engineering and software architecture. And that has led me to deal with architectures of a different sort. In the last few years, I've had the wonderful opportunity to work with the IBM Watson team, codifying the architecture of that AI system. So as we move into commercialization, we can provide a, a blueprint uh, for moving forward. And more recently, I've been involved with a number of cognitive computing activities dealing with the question of how does one take a massively parallel non-Voiman machine for which there are perhaps as many processors as there are neurons in the human mind, and how do we program it? So that's the problem I'm dealing with this week. Next week I'll have some free time, <laughs> I expect. The third face in my life uh, was mentioned earlier. My uh, beautiful bride is here with me. Jan, want to wave your hand? In the last five years, uh, my wife and I have been on a journey to develop a documentary on computing. Think of it as Carl Sagan's Cosmos, but dealing with computing. Now, why are we doing this? Well, as an insider, as I said, I have been witness to some amazing things. But I also recognize that I have a responsibility, and that responsibility is to open the curtain on computing and try to explain the implications and the beauty and the art of what we do. So our journey therein is to try to present to the public through social media, through our websites, through our books. We have a book series. Any authors out there, come see me afterwards. And also, uh, hopefully, a, a broadcast series as well to open this up to the, public, to the public. We are indeed, as a society, increasingly relying upon computerized systems to live our lives. And so I view it as a responsibility to do so in a way that we can reconcile our past, reason about our, our, future, our present, and also be very intentional about our future. What you're about to see is where all three of these things come together. My work in architecture and software engineering, my work in cognitive computing, and my attempt to bring this to the public. And we're going to touch upon a topic that invokes a lot of reactions from people. Some will say, wow, this can never be, uh, and they have this abhorrent feel to it. Others who say, why, well, yes, this is the natural conclusion. I hope by the end of this, it will lead you to consider the question as well. And it's the question of, is indeed the mind computable? I mentioned with our, uh, our series, a little bit I should point out here, there's a bit more on our website. Uh, if you go to computingthehumanexperience.com, we have this notion that the story of computing is the story of humanity, in that it is full of the drama and avarice and joy and serendipity in humanity, we find that in the stories of computing as well. And we're attempting to tell those stories. And there are a number of components for which we're, t which we're trying to do that. In our five-part series, the last episode deals with this question. And it starts here. If you consider within this space, roughly the size of a, a good-sized cantaloupe, the command of every king, the tears from every peasant, the passions from every lover have emanated from that space. That space consuming only about 20 watts of energy. And so the question for me is, where does sentience arise within that space? And how does one take the matter of the brain and turn it to the mind? Where does sentience live? We know that we are sentient, or at least most people are, I don't know about certain politicians, but most of us are sentient. We also know that a slug may not tell us on it, but we know somewhere along this spectrum that elephants can mourn their dead mates, porpoises can identify themselves in a mirror, and even chimpanzees will deceive and lie to their others in their circle. Where does sentience begin? probably in some spectrum in this space, and it's very difficult to pin down where it is. 
This is the problem of other minds, as we see Picard defending Data in this scene from Star Trek. Would you enlighten us what is required for sentience? Intelligence, self-awareness, consciousness. Prove to the court that I am sentient. This is absurd. We all know you're sentient. So I am sentient, but Commander Data is not. That's right. Uh -huh. Why? Why indeed? Where does sentience begin and where does it end? And how does sentience manifest itself from this matter? In neurophysics, we do know that the human brain is built of about 100, million, 100 billion neurons. And those neurons themselves are very digital in nature. Uh, the current model of neurons is they have a spiking behavior. They're either inputs that may be through a population or, or a time order or event order. We see these spikes that come out of them. And even though they are very analog in their construction, they can be modeled digitally to a, a good degree of fidelity. We know also that those neurons are formed in larger structures. Indeed, as Herbert Simon describes in his work, The Sciences of the Artificial, all complex systems are formed in this fashion, in which you find simpler systems, combining subsystems, and so on, and so it is with the brain itself. We are beginning to really understand what those larger structures are. And a curious thing that we have discovered in the last decade is that indeed there is a clear relationship between the mind and the matter itself in the following way. I can stimulate a part of the cortex and it reacts in the mind in terms of a feeling, a smell, a taste, a reaction in the body. And similarly, we can now through MRI map the living brain and we see that as I feel, taste, touch, smell something, we see similar reactions in the neural network. There's no magic going on there. Let me be clear that I am a reductionist, but at the same time, I reconcile that with my faith, which is a whole different lecture unto itself. But I am a reductionist in the sense that I think that there is no magic going on there. Now, I think it tells us something about us as humans that through our literature, through our art, through our movies, we have these incredible stories that we tell ourselves, stories of the creation of these sentient beings. In fact, if you go all the way back to uh, Jewish folklore, the creation of the golem, the idea of creating this, this thing out of clay and put the word of God into it and becomes animate. We see this also in Leonardo da Vinci's uh, knight, which he devised, built of uh, pulleys and, and wheels and the like. And we see this also in things such as the Dalek. And uh, uh, we see in the upper left, I think that's from the TV, the movie Metropolis. In each of these cases, what we're finding is that we tell ourselves stories of the creation of these sentient things that may be our helpmates, our companions, our friends, but they can also be our enemies. Indeed, a lot of part of the literature deals with these sentient things that turn against us. This is in the movie I, Robot with Will Smith, and you have these sentient beings, very much sentient, and yet they turn on us. What is it about us that we fear? And what is it about us that we hope in creating these kinds of creatures? There's another aspect of it that's worth telling. Whether or not you believe that we can build sentient devices, I think you can probably agree that we can achieve some degree of the illusion of sentience. Indeed, Turing spoke of that notion of the illusion of sentience. And it's hard to know where one crosses the line. If I reach that place, it leads us to ask the question, what should our relationship be to these sentient, elusive things? And how should they treat us? And we see this in another dialogue from Star Trek. This is Guinan, in which he's talking about the nature of how we might treat those sentient beings. There have always been disposable creatures. They do the dirty work. They do the work that no one else wants to do because it's too difficult or too hazardous. And an army of data is all disposable. You don't have to think about their welfare. You don't think about how they feel. Whole generations of disposable people. So are we on a path to create such disposable creatures? Um, 
I haven't talked to the folks directly, but I believe it's, I think it's at Cambridge, there's a group that's formed that's attempting to wrestle with the question of this existential issue of sentient devices and how far we can come along the way and indeed what is our moral responsibility to such things. Now let's get a little technical here. Let's examine the journey of how far we can go in building sentient beings and what kind of architectures may be possible or necessary to achieve this illusion. We can go all the way back to Descartes, or actually even further than that, if you look at some of the uh, mythologies, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, I mean in the sense of, of what Joseph Campbell describes of, uh, the mythologies of our faith, which talk about the creation of sentience from dust. Descartes also viewed it as something that came from a device inside the mind, the pineal gland in particular, which was the intermediary between our body and God, and he viewed that as the resting place of sentience. Well, we know a little bit better today in that science suggests to us that there is no magic like that, but rather it lives in something that is potentially computable. But wait, you may say. Uh, isn't it the case that we build machines that only do those things that we tell them to do? Uh, this is exactly what Joseph Campbell described. Uh, he said that computers are like Old Testament gods, uh, lots of rules and no mercy. This is especially true, by the way, if you're using Windows. Uh, but this was, <laughs> you notice I have a Macintosh because I, I prefer to use a real operating system. <clears throat> but I have, oh, somebody said, boo, boo, yes. That's okay. I've, I've used Windows in the past, and I've lived. Um, <laughs> but there's a similar perspective that uh, Ada, the Countess of Lovelace, describes, in which she said, you know, the analytic engine has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. And I think that's a reasonable perspective that most of the public will accept, that we only, these things only do what we tell them to do, and yet, we as insiders know that it's possible to build machines of exquisite, astonishing, breathtaking complexity. For example, consider the Asma robot coming from Honda, and it has disturbingly very human-like behavior. In the scene we're seeing here, we see a fleet of the Asma robots that are through facial recognition seeing people who come in the door and directing them to different places within the office. They aren't human, we would say they are not sentient, but they're on this side of the uncanny valley. They look kind of creepily like us. I think there are a number of reasons why we see this more so in Japan than in any other part of the world. Uh, within Japan you have Shintoism, which accepts the belief, very much part of the belief, that inanimate objects embody a spirit. So it is very reasonable, it's acceptable, to take the notion that these devices do indeed have the breath of life within them. There's an economic reason as well, too. Within Japan, we find a, uh, a decreasing population. The, the, the country is actually getting smaller in terms of its native population, and the demographics are such that it's an aging population. So there is an economic need for devices in one form or another that begin to attend to the elderly. And so we begin to see the rise of devices, not just like ASMO, but also devices such as uh, the little Abio dog, or more recently there's a little, been a little seal that's been created which are used in elder care. So you have some device to which the elderly can bond. People do this with pets. Why not devices we create ourselves? So the notion is very acceptable, and we begin to see the patterns of human interaction with these devices that we know indeed are not sentient, yet we bond to them as if indeed they were alive. How far can we go? Well, I think astonishingly, we can go very far, such as what we see with this device from a, uh, from a manufacturing Please candidate. let go of my arm. You are hurting me. Why did you do that for? It's hurt. And she goes on to say, please don't do that anymore. So what we see here is at least the illusion of a device that feels and has some goal setting associated with it. Is that sentience? Well, we would not say that this device is sentience, but we're moving along the path to get us to that point. And 
Increasingly, we're going to see these kinds of devices because there is great economic pull as well as technological push along the way to get us there. So let's examine that journey for a bit and just see how far we are along the path and see where it might lead us. I'll the begin with Ed. manifest destiny of computer science. That is the end of the road. But the goal is AI. Uh, Dr. Ed Feigenbaum is one of the, the luminaries of early artificial intelligence. And of course, he's known for the work he has done in knowledge engineering. But he pointed out that really it has been the driving force, the manifest destiny, to use a little bit of a, a little bit of a United States history here, the drive to the coast to build systems that are indeed sentience. Now, within the journey of AI, we've seen some staggering disappointments, we've seen some amazing setbacks, we've seen some serendipitous discoveries along the way. So briefly let me walk you through those major ages of AI and lead up to where we are in AI at the moment. In some ways it begins with Turing himself. In Turing's later work in the 50s, he particularly addressed the issue of how far can we go with sentience. And he described in what we call the Turing test today, what he called the imitation game in his time frame, is that we could declare in a computer to be intelligent if it could deceive a human being. And that's, that's the test. Of course, the, the notion of the Turing test was actually named in, in Arthur C. Clarke's book, 2001, A Space Odyssey, when he spoke of it with HAL 9000. Now, in this journey toward AI, these are the, the major phases we have seen. Around World War, end of World War II, uh, we saw the work of George Walter, uh, a computer scientist from the UK, and his tortoises. Uh, we saw the work of Norbert Wiener as well, and his ideas in cybernetics. They were all very biologically inspired. They were built somewhat from the notions of control systems from, from uh, devices in World War II, because those things seemed to have some behavior that looked very biological in their basis. But it was clear there are limits on how far we can go with just the pure cybernetic approach to the world. The next stage in this was the pure semantic information processing. This is the days of, of Minsky and Simon and others who realized that we can begin to codify the way we manipulate symbols in very powerful ways. And the question they ask is, isn't this indeed the way the mind works. Well, from this period of time, this was the, this is the great flourishing of AI, which lasted for a, a decade or so. And it led us to some amazing developments, such as the blocks world, the beginning of some natural language programming things. We see here Shaky at the bottom, uh, a robot built by SRI, and, and Minsky was involved with it to a degree. Uh, some things, interesting things come out of this. Um, from Shaky, uh, we had the development of some mapping algorithms, which led to the A star algorithm, and that's the basis of the algorithm you see in Google Maps when it moves you from one location to another. So a lot of the things that came out from the AI world back in the 60s and, and so on have manifested themselves in very interesting systems today. It also led to things such as Elijah. Elijah was a Rogerian type psychotherapist and what was fascinating about it, it was incredibly simple. Uh, you would, as a Rogerian therapist would say, as my wife would tell me about it, it's really nice being married to a psychotherapist, by the way. <laughs> it's, it's very handy at times. Although she has a full job on your hand, she's, she's not denying this. Uh, a Rogerian therapist would say, you know, I'm feeling like this today. Oh, really? Tell me how you're feeling. It would come back in a series of questions. So what Elijah did was to pick and choose from some of those key phrases and begin a dialogue. What one found astonishing at this time frame is he would find some people that would bond with this machine, would bond with this program and begin to pour their hearts out on it, assuming that this thing was a real human behind the scenes. And for them, it was very, very real. For them, it passed the Turing test. But we know certainly it wasn't. Well. This age passed very quickly, and for a number of reasons, uh, one of which it was, it was ahead of its time. Uh, we were trying to do things that far exceeded our ability within the machinery we have. Uh, this is the rise of Lisp machines, the rise of uh, Lisp as a dominant language. But 
even on the machine side, there were some fundamental problems we were having in approaching the very way of dealing with symbolic processing as the basis of mind. It was uh, this gentleman, uh, Herbert Dreyfus, now at the University of California at Berkeley, who really put the nail in the coffin at the, the beginning of the AI winter, in which he observed, no, wait a minute, you're doing something wrong here. The brain really doesn't work this way. And he attacked the approaches that Simon and Minsky did, really on four bases. He asked the question, is the brain digital? And it's really not in the ways that it was viewed back in the 60s and 70s. It's not purely on-off like we see it. And we know today it is far more complex, although, as I mentioned, we know how to model it in digital forms these days. He also observed that the brain really doesn't operate in as formal ways as you think it does. It doesn't work like a processor. It works in some different ways. And then he became, you know, fairly philosophical, asking the questions, is it indeed possible to formalize the world and our way in it? And the answer is probably no. So he really devastated the notion that the mind works in ways that are purely symbolic. The mind probably works in other ways. And that's where the next step of the journey led to us. Another interesting discussion that happened around this time was, was John Searle's notion of the Chinese room. Uh, the Chinese room argument goes like this. I've got a room, I put a human inside of it with a set of tables, and I feed into it uh, some language, Chinese or whatever, and outside of it I get a translation. And inside all that's happening is that the human is going through these tables and the like and simply following a set of rules. Searle's point was that human doesn't really understand. There is no thinking going on. Well, there are a number of, of arguments that tear apart his notion of the room. Hofstetter, in particular, uh, does a, a pretty good description of, of why he believes this, this metaphor doesn't really fit. Uh, one in particular is that it's not the human that's supposed to understand. It is the system as, as a whole. Indeed, this nature leads us to the realization that it's not the individual parts that have sentience. So like Descartes, I can't say therein in the brain lies the seat of sentience. This is where it lives in the palace. But rather, it is a systems issue. And it was around this time, too, that the whole notion of chaos theory and systems theory began to come into the forefront. So we began to see this collusion of ideas, a movement away from the symbolic, and a move toward more systems theory and more statistical theory that led us to the present state of AI that is much more statistical in its nature. One great example of this is Watson. Watson was the machine uh, we built at IBM to play Jeopardy. Now, I don't know if Jeopardy shows up here in syndication in the UK, but it's a, it's a challenging game because on the one hand, you have to do some random natural language processing. You've got to interpret what it means. But it's also full of puns. It will say a variety of things like, uh, uh, well, you'll see an example in a moment, but it will use play on words, and it will, it will use references to cultural things. So how does one do that as a human? Well, we are, are full of these kinds of little bits of random information. And the really great players of Jeopardy uh, are the ones who are able to bring those associations together very, very rapidly. Indeed, the average response for the, the winning circle tends to be within a second or so that they can respond. So the, the stakes were very high for Watson because we wanted to do this within real time and to actually beat the best human players. I had the opportunity also to play against Watson uh, in, in a team of two others, and there was another playing against us. We came in second place, but, but Watson did some really stupid things. But overall, it had such consistent behavior that it would eventually beat us out. And here's one of the interactions I had with it. So Watson, in the category Gravity's Rainbow, this scientist said that he understood how it behaved, but not how it worked. Watson? Who is Sir Isaac Newton. Correct. <clears throat> now, Watson, we've seen from Mr. Shepard's presentation how you behave. Would you be willing to explain to us how you work? I'm sorry, Grady. I'm afraid I can't do that. <laughs> Little trivia question. Uh, on the symbology for Watson here, uh, you, you don't see them all at once, but how many little things are orbiting the globe? Any idea how many there are? 
42, yes, there are 42 of them. So, yeah. <laughs> How does Watson work? There's no magic, but it looks pretty magical on the outside. Watson is a pipe and filter architecture. We take in the front of Watson, uh, the text. We don't actually do uh, audio distinguishing of what it is, but we bring in the text of it. Watson breaks that apart, and we form about a 100,000 or more different possible hypotheses for what it might mean. We do forward chaining. We then take that, look through Wikipedia, lots of other things, and we take it then to about a million or more possibilities that we then do backward chaining against. And that backward chaining is then checked against possibilities. So what Watson will do is to say, I think this has an X percent probability of being correct because I find this evidence against it. And then Watson comes back and says, here are my top three choices ranked in the statistical fashion. There's no magic, but the amazing thing about Watson is that it does it very, very quickly. There's been a lot of interesting work in natural language processing in the last several years, but I think the key difference that Watson brought to the table is to find a way to have a society of these things, hundreds of thousands of them, competing for possibilities as a reasonable answer. Now, where Watson has led us is not to the replacement of humans, but we now see Watson used in medicine. Indeed, there is an instance of Watson used to take a look at uh, MRIs and diagnose the potential of cancer. And now, they're not going to go and say, Watson, what do you think, and let's go do it, but rather we're positioning Watson as a helpmate, an assistant, and ultimately will be the human that makes those kinds of decisions. So this is where Watson is today. What's next? What's next moves along this confluence, as I mentioned, leading to the notion of a society of mind. The, side, the, the idea of the philosophy of mind coming from the society of mind comes from Minsky's work in his book, The Society of Mind. And it takes the notion that there's not really symbolic processing that's going on, but rather it is emergent behavior from the presence of many, many things that leads us to this illusion of sentience. Indeed, there's a wonderful book uh, called Is Consciousness an Illusion? And it may be that the notion of a system seeing itself, and we do it so rapidly, gives us the illusion that we know we know. And yet we do it quickly enough that we can emote and say, yes, I am indeed, I think, therefore I am. We'll hear it in, in Marvin Zone's words. When we make machines that have these multiple levels of organization, we'll find that when, if the machine manages, if we manage to make it uh, have the same sort of structure that the human brain has, we don't know enough about that yet to do it, that it will report the same sorts of things. And when it says, I see blue, we'll be able to see all the processes that this involve. And we'll also see that it doesn't involve much understanding of what that process is, and so it seems very mysterious and unphysical. Let me unpack three things that he had to say here. One is he said, we don't know enough about the brain. Well, that was true in his time frame, but as we'll see in a moment, there's a tremendous amount that we do know now about the brain. He also talked about the problem of this thing is blue, and I declare it as such. This is the problem of qualia. How do I know that something feels this way? Or how do I know that green looks like green to me and it looks like green to you? That's a really difficult philosophical question. But I think we can only judge it by what is the emergent behavior we see from it. If I see something green and I declare it to be green, how do I behave in its presence versus how do you behave in its presence? And if we behave in similar fashions, I think we can agree that no matter what happens below the surface, we're still seeing the illusion of the same experience. The third element he mentioned, he began to allude to this notion of, of societies. And indeed, we see the idea of societies manifest in things such as simple as the flocking of birds. A bird by itself does not know how to flock. I have to speak, pronounce this very carefully. A bird does not know how to flock. But what a bird does know about is in the presence of other birds, it follows a couple of simple rules. It stays a certain average distant, distance from the nearby bird, and it also tends to go in a vector that's the general mass of all the other birds. 
you do that and you begin to see this exquisite behavior that looks, creates these kinds of shapes and such. Now that's one of the things that I think that's been discovered in the architecture of the mind in the last several years. But there's another element that's been learned and this comes from uh, Dr. Rodney Brooks in particular. Uh, Dr. Brooks was the head of the MIT AI lab for some time and he brought the notion that it is impossible to build a mind that is disembodied. But rather he viewed that in our minds we have evolved over the last multiple millennium because we are injected in the world and we live in the world and we interact with the world, we co-evolve with the world and that has impacted the way we think and the way our minds have evolved as well. It's through that work that he did a couple of really interesting developments. One of these are, are humanoid-like robots uh, such as Kismet. Kismet's really cute, you got to admit. And who, what's not to love about Kismet? And Kismet's a little bit old, but it gives you some notion of where his, his mind was, that we were trying to build systems, they were trying to build systems that would interact with humans because it displayed at least the illusion of emotion. The other thing that architecturally uh, Dr. Brooks observed was the notion of what today we would call a subsumption architecture. A subsumption architecture says that I build a system in layers. At the bottom layer we build things that interact with the physical world. They both sense as well as activate. We have a layer on top of it that controls those in some grosser fashion. Uh, I know how to, at the bottom level, I know how to move an arm. At the layer above it, I can now project a path within space and it then moves the arms. And at layers above it, built on top, we eventually see goal seeking. Now what's interesting about this is it goes back to Herbert Simon's ideas of architecture as well, which says that all interesting complex systems are built in layers and furthermore all systems at one level of abstraction or another appear to be message passing systems, strikingly like what we find within the human nervous system as well too. We see this manifest in very pragmatic ways, such as in the, uh, the Mars rover. The Mars rover is a classic subsumption architecture. Because of the distances between us and Mars, it's not like somebody sitting here on the ground with a joystick moving this thing around because the latency would be impossible. But rather the way it works is that we'll, at the end of the day, uh, end of the Martian day, uh, it will take an image around it and then the geophysicists will say, this looks like a particularly interesting rock over here. And they'll do mission planning and then eventually upload commands to the rover saying, go there. And then locally it does all the things necessary to get it there without running over rocks or hitting a boulder or falling in a pit. So it is semi-autonomous in that sense. Using again, very similar algorithms like what you saw way back in Shaky to find its way around the world. That's my view of the world, and I want to respect that there are alternative views of the world. I do believe that the mind is reducible, and that it is possible for us to build systems that are indeed uh, computably sentient. Sir Roger Penrose takes an alternative view, and he bases it upon some ideas of Gödel, as well as some ideas that live within the realm of quantum physics. Mathematical understanding. Mathematical understanding depends upon consciousness. But mathematical understanding is not something of a purely computational character. There is something else which has to come into that. So that's, the mathematics only comes in to demonstrate that there is some part of our conscious thinking which you cannot simulate on a computer. So the basis of his argument is that because of Gödel's theorem, we know that there are some things that are inherently non-computable, and he equates this to the requirement for sentience. Um, I don't agree with that line of thinking and neither did Turing. Indeed, Turing in one of his early papers on machine and intelligence, machine intelligence uh, also observed that Godelian arguments may, may uh, be brought up against the notion of machine and sentience, but, uh, but I think Turing broke those down pretty well. Uh, Sir, Sir Roger Penrose goes on to suggest that what's really happening are some things down at the quantum level. And there have been some arguments against that saying, I'll get a little technical here for a moment, the very thermodynamics of the mind are such that it operates at a temperature that means the wave front of any quantum computation would collapse before it could ever manifest itself. I'll reduce that to simply say it's too hot to work is what he's basically saying. So 
but I respect it, and there are alternative views in that same ilk, but, but I still land at the place where I think the mind is computable. But no matter where you land on that, you have to face a reality that we are on this path to achieve machines that at least achieve the illusion of sentience. And we have to come to grips with that. Um, Minsky mentioned that we don't know enough about the brain. That's changing. There is a major effort inside the EU, uh, richly funded, to map the entire brain, and not just to map it, but also to build a complete simulation of the brain down to the neural level. This is also what uh, President Obama spoke of in the State of the Union address earlier this year, and what he spoke of as the active brain map. And the most powerful computer in the world isn't nearly as intuitive as the one we're born with. So there, there's this enormous mystery uh, waiting to be unlocked. And the Brain Initiative will change that by giving scientists the tools they need to get a dynamic picture of the brain in action and better understand how we think and how we learn and how we remember. There has always been an irrational exuberance within the AI community, thinking that it's just around the corner, especially if you look at uh, Ray Kurzweil's work. He's, he's got an actual date for when we're going to break through here. Ray, you're wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I wish I could have a chance to talk with him. I've never done so. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest in saying that I, I respect where, where Ray is thinking. I think a lot of what he is hoping for is a projection of his personal hopes and fears. And I respect that from his humanity. But from what I know in terms of the technology, it's not going to happen in the time frame he suggests. There is a lot more that we, we know we don't know yet. And yet, there is this fascinating confluence that's happening. On the one hand, we have a far better understanding of how one architects excruciatingly complex systems and how to build them. At the same time, through Obama's work and through the EU effort, we're beginning to understand to a very detailed level, level the mechanisms of the mind itself. So these two things are coming together, and based upon what we know doesn't work in the past of AI, we're in this interesting space right now that's leading us to the creation of these systems that at least give the illusion of sentience. So you may wonder, are the robots really going to take over, or are they going to become their helpmates? Are there really, are there really things to fear? Well, I need to tell you a secret. The robots have already taken over. <laughs> They've already won. Consider any time you've gone on a phone tree and not talked to a human. And, and gone through some device that listens to you. There are now, now algorithms out there that can sense the tone of your voice and react differently if you were angry or happy. And of course, everybody's happy when they call the call center, right? <laughs> and indeed, one of the instances of the next use of, of Watson is to replace people in call centers because we know enough about natural language processing to be able to replace that human. Think again what Turing said, if we can give the illusion of a human, we have an intelligent machine. We're very much on that path. Not just there, but we see that in a lot of interactions, in our airports, in our train stations, heavens, even Sierra. Read me the message. New message from Sebastian. Great news. We got the go ahead. Can you meet at 10? Reply, definitely. I'll see you there. There's something, I don't know if you observed in those last three scenes, there were no other people. So in effect, we continually build technology in which we no longer need people. Now that means there are some fundamental economic implications for what's happening here. Another thread we could begin to discuss are the economic implications of technology and that I believe firmly that this has contributed to the global economic malaise in the sense that we are building technology that no longer requires as many humans. Therefore, we still have as many humans as we did, and even more so, but we simply don't have the jobs for them anymore. Computation has replaced humans, and that's not going to go away by any means. It's also the case that we see these kinds of semi-intelligent devices weave their way into places of our world in very, very subtle fashion, such that we don't even notice they're there. Go watch a movie, and any time, unless it's a movie by Cecil B. DeMille, 
you're going to see scenes of crowds, creatures, uh, people, things like that. Most of them have been built using an agent-based system called Massive from a, a group out of uh, New Zealand. Massive's first big breakthrough was in The Lord of the Rings, in, in the, the big scenes where the ogres are attaching, attacking the castle. If you look at some of the outtakes, it's really interesting because you'll see some of the scenes that didn't make it where the ogres have their own local, local kind of behavior and some of them start fighting their own neighboring ogres or they'll start running the opposite direction, it's just like humans. But what you see here within, within this world, within the, within the world of film, is that the ability to build systems that look very human-like, very few of these are actually humans that are, that are playing a role here. We also see this in our, in our warehouses. Uh, Amazon is, Amazon's warehouses are full of these small robots that move things around, again replacing humans. Uh, Rodney Brooks's latest company is building this robot, which has common sense. It can look at something and say, I know these basic rules behind it. Notice the gratuitous eye candy with this. It's got a, a, a face on the top, which has absolutely no functional purpose except to make us feel comfortable around this device. So already we're building things so that the machines begin to adapt to us. And of course, there's also the Google autonomous car. Uh, this is an image from what Google sees. And the remarkable thing about this is this is transforming not only car driving, but also the insurance business. Because now it's possible to have people who drive cars who are blind. So how does one build a business model if you have cars that never get into an accident? And that changes the economics of insurance companies. How do I deal with that? So here's the reality that I find. We are in a fascinating place uh, in, in computing at the moment. Uh, this confluence of architecture and large systems and what we know about the brain and models of the brain is leading us to build systems that are sentient in nature, if not in reality. It is inevitable. We can't turn this around. It is something that is unavoidable. And furthermore, the implications, no matter how far we go, are extraordinary. What we see here is actually a Japanese robot that dances. And at first glance, it looks very, very human. So as insiders, we know the possibilities of this path, and we are those who are creating this kind of technology. We have a responsibility, I believe, to educate the public as to what's possible and what's not, and to build systems of, of ethical standing such that these are things that work in our good, uh, not against evil. Indeed, this opens up a whole can of worms with regards to autonomous weapons that are lethal, drones and the whole like. Uh, we know the, we have the ability today to build a drone that can be armed, that can distinguish between a schoolyard and a cemetery. So in effect, we are already building machines that have some sense of our value and ethics. We will be coexisting with these machines. We will co-evolve with them. And I think it leads us to ask the question, how then shall we live as humans? It is a question that we all individually will have to wrestle with. Thank you very much.